So, our next speaker, William B. Grant, has a PhD in physics from the University of California, Berkeley. He had a 30-year career in atmospheric sciences with an emphasis on laser remote sensing of atmospheric constituents such as ozone and aerosols with positions at SRI International, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California Institute of Technology, and NASA Langley Research Center. He turned to health research in 1996, publishing the first paper linking diet to risk of Alzheimer's disease in 1997, followed by studies of sugar, fat, and coronary heart disease in animal products and cancer risk in 1998. In 1999, he turned his attention to the role of solar ultraviolet, ultraviolet B exposure in reducing risk of cancer through production of vitamin D. And in 2002, added eight types of cancer to the five already known to be so affected. After retirement from NASA in 2004, he moved to San Francisco and formed the nonprofit organization Sunlight Nutrition and Health Research Center, uh, www.sunarc.org. He spends most of his time studying the role of solar UVB exposure and vitamin D in reducing risk of various types of disease, writing reviews and reviewing manuscripts. He also works closely with several vitamin D advocacy organizations. He has about 360 health publications listed at pubmed.gov, of which 260 are related to vitamin D, with 90 of these also on ultraviolet radiation and human health, and 40 on diet and disease. Uh, Bill Grant is one of our board members here, and we're happy to have him and happy to hear his expertise tonight. Please welcome Bill Grant. Thank you. It's good to be back here. Um, I spoke last October on a similar topic, but this is then it was vitamin D, now it's the sun, and vitamin D is part of the benefits of, of sunlight. So I'm going to here's the outline of the talk this evening. Um, start with the solar spectrum and skin pigmentation, vitamin D physiology, then talk about a number of uh, diseases such as cancer that are linked to low UVB exposure and vitamin D, then about pregnancy and birth outcomes then move to the non-vitamin D effects of sunlight, then discuss the dark side, uh, melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancer, uh, turn then to how the medical system dismisses uh, interest in, in vitamin D, some recommendations, and just uh, a little bit about the book, Embrace the Sun. So the solar spectrum, the, the sun is essentially a black body, and the spectrum is the orange line that's sort of a smooth line peaking around um, in the blue and then uh, coming down sharply. The atmospheric molecules uh, absorb a lot of the sunlight. Uh, so in the infrared region, which is what we feel is heat, uh, there are several places like where we're absorbed by CO2 and methane and water vapor where some of the spectrum does not reach the Earth's surface and which gives rise to, to warming the atmosphere and climate change as the carbon dioxide and methane builds up. Of course, the visible, uh, which we see. Then there's the ultraviolet, which has uh, two parts to get through. There's the long wave UV called UVA from 400 down to 315, 320 nanometers. Then you have the UVB, which is shorter than that, th uh, around 290 to 315 nanometers. And that represents only three to 5% of the UVB, uh, of the UV spectrum, but it's the most active part. It produces vitamin D. It also is most responsible for, for sunburning and, and erythema. Okay, so the, um, to underscore the, to show how important the, the ultraviolet spectrum is, we, we've now realized that it is what has caused the change in skin pigmentation around the world. Um, and the, the skin pigmentation adapts um, to, to the, the protection and uh, allowing the benefits to accrue. So you have to have a dark enough skin to pre uh, prevent the free radicals from forming and causing uh, skin cancer, melanoma, and also for destroying folate, which is very important for pregnancy and, 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 and so on. Um, you know, in, the, in the tropics, in the, in the tropical plains like in Africa, uh, the sun is intense enough that the very dark skin still permits enough UVB to reach down to the cholesterol layer to produce vitamin D. In the tropical forests, 
um, there's enough protection from the, from the forest that brown skin is, is acceptable. But when people moved out of Africa and moved up into Europe, uh, they had to have paler skin in order to produce uh, vitamin D uh, and the other benefits of, 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 of um, uh, UV exposure. It turns out, because of this adaptation uh, from skin pigmentation, the, 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 the serum, the vitamin D status, the vitamin D, what we call vitamin D levels, which is actually uh, based on 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels, uh, is actually pretty much the same worldwide, uh, around 20 to 22 nanograms per milliliter, unless, unless people wear a lot of clothing, like in the Middle East, then they have much lower levels. But uh, it's, it's been a, a very <coughs> robust system. Now, one of the problems is that in the United States, we have a lot of people with dark skin who've come from Africa, so they're making much less vitamin D than, they, they would, than would be uh, advisable. And you have people from Northern Europe who have pale skin who very easily uh, sunburn and, and, and so on. So that's been part of the problem. So now, it's called a vitamin, but vitamin D is actually a steroid hormone. And hormones help control metabolism, inflammation, immune function, and the ability to withstand illness and injury. All steroid hormones are made from cholesterol, and vitamin D is, is made from what's called 7-dehydrocholesterol in, in, just in the skin. Now, vitamin D acts primarily through affecting uh, gene expression, and that is done through the hormonal metabolite of vitamin D called 125-dihydroxyvitamin D, and it activates vitamin D receptors coupled to chromosomes, which can thereby, uh, thereby affect gene expression, upregulating uh, some genes, downregulating others. Over 1,000 genes can be regulated by 125-dihydroxyvitamin D. Uh, vitamin D physiology is actually really complex. So when vitamin D comes in either through a diet or supplements or through the skin, uh, it, it can go to the liver where it receives a hydroxyl group and becomes a 25-hydroxy vitamin D, which has a half-life of two to three weeks. It can then go to the kidney where it can get a second hydroxyl group and become the active hormone or 125-dihydroxy vitamin D which has a half-life of about two hours, but it is involved in helping to regulate uh, serum calcium, which has to be in a very narrow range for, for optimal health. So if, if, um, uh, if you have low serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels, then you, ha you have low absorption from the, um, from the intestines, and you're gonna get your, your calcium taken from the bones. Now, the, the, the 25 hydroxy vitamin D can also go to the many organs, where, which also have the ability to add a hydroxyl group. So as needed, they will um, make the 125 in the breast tissue, in the skin, in the uh, kidneys, and uh, other organs to, do, make, to, uh, to generate the, high, the hormonal uh, reaction. So, uh, Vitamin D can be made primarily only when the sun is above 45 degrees in the horizon. When your shadow is shorter than you are, you can make vitamin D. So that's during the middle of the day and the middle of the summer. So the dermatologists have a, a shadow rule. They say if your shadow is shorter than you are, cover up, put on sunscreen, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you're not gonna make any vitamin D then. So we, we also have the, the, the people like vitamin D also have the shadow rule, which is if your shadow is shorter, enjoy it, make vitamin D. Um, so we're at about 37 or 38 degrees north latitude, which means that for about six or seven months of the year, we can make um, uh, vitamin D fairly easily. Um, during the rest of the year, we can make vitamin D, it might take longer. Uh, but of course, if you live and in, work indoors, live in a city with high rise buildings, live in San Francisco with a lot of fog and clouds, it's gonna be very hard to make vitamin D in winter. And this just shows that there are seasonal variations in both the, uh, the 25 hydroxy vitamin D, that's the blue in the bottom, and in the PTH, uh, the parathyroid hormone, which um, is, uh, acts to, to make up for, for low uh, vitamin D in terms of uh, regulating serum calcium. 
So now what types of studies are used to determine risk factors, um, uh, links between risk factors and disease? Okay, so there are ecological studies based on geographical variations of populations or temporal variations of populations. So there are ecological studies which can be either based on geographical variations of populations or temporal changes in populations like seasonal variations. You have observational studies which can be prospective. You enroll people, you measure their, their characteristics and follow them for a while. They can be case control studies in which you, somebody comes in, has cancer say, you measure their serum 25 hydroxyvitamin D and whatever else. And you have cross-sectional studies where you go around the country and you measure people who just measure all sorts of parameters and their health conditions. You can do uh, studies of mechanisms, um, uh, more, more in the laboratory, and you can do randomized controlled trials. Now, the randomized controlled trials you enroll people and randomly assign them to a treatment or control arm. In general, the vitamin D randomized controlled trials have not supported the findings from observational studies, leading the vitamin D opponents to propose that vitamin D deficiency is a consequence rather than a cause of disease. Um, however, most vitamin D cl uh, clinical trials have been based on the guidelines for pharmaceutical drugs. And the two basic assumptions are, first of all, that the trial is the only source of the agent, and secondly, there's a linear dose-response relationship. Neither of these assumptions is satisfied for vitamin D, uh, which is why many, uh, many of the trials have failed. These trials should be based on serum 25 hydroxyvitamin D concentrations from start to finish. You measure people's 25 hydroxyvitamin D at the outset. You then maybe give them a dose based on how high you want to get the 25 hydroxyvitamin D level. And then you measure the achieved 25 reduction vitamin D. Um, we now know that, and, 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 and our new trials are being based on that. However, a lot of the large trials, such as the, the, the VITAL trial out of Harvard, was still based on the old approach. Enroll them, give them 2,000 IU per day, and see what happens. Now, the Embrace the Sun, the book, does not reference vitamin D clinical trials. We assume that serum 25 hydroxyvitamin D concentration is primarily a measure of sun exposure, since 90% of vitamin D typically comes from sun exposure, although meat, fish, and supplements are also important sources of vitamin D. Thus, serum 25 hydroxyvitamin D can represent benefits occurring through vitamin D and non vitamin D mechanisms of UVB exposure. Now, going into ancient history, uh, Herodotus wrote about the Battle of Pelusium from 525 BC. And what he noted was that the skulls of Persians were thin while the skulls of the Egyptians were thick. It turns out the Persians always wore felt skull caps. The Egyptians shaved their heads from childhood. Uh, and that explained the difference. But also recall that the Egyptians had a sun god, Ra. I mean, do we have a sun god now? No. We have the sun demon, if you listen to the, uh, to the dermatologists. That's why you should wear hats, wear clothing, uh, wear sunscreen, stay out of the sun because it, it might kill you. Well, so in a historical overview, lack of sunlight was finally linked to risk of rickets in 1822. But it was not until the early 1920s that vitamin D was discovered and related to reducing risk of rickets. In fact, uh, the, the teaspoon or so of, of cod liver oil that re prevented rickets had about 400 IU of vitamin D. And that's why a lot of the trials, um, early trials on vitamin D gave 400 IU per day, thinking that the main benefit of vitamin D was reducing rickets. However, in the 20s through the 50s, it was also shown that um, uh, sunlight reduced the risk of dental caries. And people looked at dental rank um, and, and um, as a function of location by state. And what I plotted here is a dental rank, the higher the dental rank, that means a poor uh, dental condition. So if you had, if the UVB was less than about seven kilojoules per meter squared, uh, you had progressively worse uh, oral health. But if above that, you pretty much had a flat, um, had a plateau. So now going on to, to cancer, in 1972, four, two beginning public health graduate students Cedric and Frank Garland 
saw maps of cancer mortality rates in the United States. Having just driven from San Diego to Baltimore, they immediately made the connection between UVB, vitamin D, and colon cancer. That was the only cancer that, that had a large enough variation geographically that they could, they could uh, uh, see a sunlight effect. But it took them six years to get the finding published, and then it was in a British journal. So here is a map, a more, a more modern map with 10 uh, scales, uh, like what they saw. And so in the northeast, where it's red, you have the higher mortality rates. In the southwest, you have the lowest mortality rates in blue. What they did was they just plotted contours of average annual sunlight and showed that there was a, a, a good correspondence. Um, uh, if you look at breast cancer, it has a similar pattern, but you see there's more pink and red on, in the West Coast. I think the, part of the reason that there's more pink and red is that women, women probably spend less time in the sun than men do, and when they spend time in the sun, they probably have more clothing on. Along the coast, you see more red and pink than inland. That's because you have a lot of fog and clouds along the coast, uh, like San Francisco, for example. You see in the Bay Area, you have a lot of red. Um, so in my work, I've used the, uh, the UVB data at the Earth Service for July 1992, obtained from a, a NASA uh, total ozone mapping spectrometer. And what's interesting is that uh, there's a, an asymmetry here. The west has, uh, okay, the pink is the highest UVB, uh, then you go to the yellows and the browns, and eventually to the blues. So on the west coast, in the western half of the United States, you have generally a higher surface elevation, uh, so you have less atmosphere attenuating the UVB through scatter, but you also have a thinner ozone layer um, in the west because the as the westerly winds come across the United States, they reach the Rocky Mountains and they have to cross the Rocky Mountains and that pushes the tropopause higher and makes the stratospheric ozone layer thinner. So this asymmetry is a good signal of the, uh, so you look here, there is an asymmetry and asymmetry here. And I've shown that if you take the 500 state economic areas uh, that were uh, indicated there, you do find that as you go out in higher UVB, you do have um, lower cancer mortality rates. But something happened more recently. If you look at the data from 2000, 2004 for breast cancer for white females, which includes Hispanics, you don't see the pattern anymore. What's happened? Well, uh, we spend less time in the sun. We wear sunscreen. Uh, obesity is, is much higher now and improved survival rates. So all of these factors have, have sort of uh, merged together to get rid of the geographical pattern that we had in, from 1950 to 1994. Now we can turn to um, um, observational studies for breast cancer. This is a, a, a graph I made from, based on 11 case control studies from seven countries. And I geographically overlaid the um, these studies. So these, in these studies, they often have three or four or five quantiles. So they will group people into different 25-hydroxyvitamin D groups. And what you see here is that if you get below 10 nanograms per milliliter, you have a very high rate of, of breast cancer, which is actually about a factor of almost 10 higher than if you get out to 60 nanograms per milliliter. So it, it changes very rapidly at first and then more slowly. And I put to the AA and WA here to indicate that African Americans typically have a mean value of 16 nanograms per milliliter, whereas white Americans have, uh, Caucasian Americans have more like 26, Hispanics are more like 21 nanograms per milliliter. And it turns out that African Americans have about a 25 to 30 percent higher, at least breast cancer mortality rate, um, and they have also about 25 to 30 percent higher rates of all sorts of disease, non skeletal diseases. Here, a recent study just published uh, in, um, in PLOS-1 in, uh, about a month or two ago. Uh, this was um, a joint effort uh, based on studies done in South Carolina and in Nebraska, organized by grassrootshealth.net. Um, in fact, Carol Baggerly, who runs grassrootshealth.net, calls herself a breast cancer treatment survivor. 
And I first met her in 2006 when she came to my poster in Anaheim at a, at a, at a cancer conference. And she came on a Sunday morning and spent four hours there just glued to my poster, listening to people come in and wanting to know what about vitamin D and cancer. Well, she then formed Grassroots Health about that time and is one of the strongest proponents of, of vitamin D in the country. And she's realized that our health system is not going to keel over and say, everybody take vitamin D. There's too much money, too much profit and income from, from not telling people to take vitamin D. Anyway, in this study, what happened was they, they, they uh, went to South Carolina and enrolled about 1,000 uh, or, or 2,000 people and told them, here's free vitamin D. Uh, try to raise your, uh, your serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels and let's see what happens. And you see that you have the same sort of pattern here. If, for those who had less than, than 20 nanograms per milliliter, they had a rate of about 800, 750, 800 ca cases per 100,000 per, uh, per, per per 100, people per year rate of, of breast cancer. By the time you got to uh, 70 nanograms per milliliter, you had only 134 cases per 100,000 per year. And it's pretty much a linear straight line. Um, so this is a, it's not a, a clinical, it's not a randomized controlled trial, it's sort of, but it is an observational trial based on vitamin D, serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentrations being raised by taking vitamin D. Now, going on further beyond cancer, it was only this century that has become widely realized that um, UVB exposure and vitamin D reduce the risk of many diseases, including autoimmune diseases, cancer, cardiovascular disease, infectious diseases, neurological diseases, et cetera, and improve pregnancy and birth outcomes. I should say we, we realize that having the higher concentrations is associated with lower risk of disease. Uh, the causality is not really totally proven in all these cases. For example, in cardiovascular disease, the giving people vitamin D does not, has not resulted in showing that they have a lower risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, but there is a seasonal variation and uh, it certainly helps to have higher concentrations. Uh, here's a, uh, an observational study from, um, South Car uh, from the southern United States in a community near San Diego. And uh, this is published by Park. Cedric Garland, who was involved in the 1980 paper on cancer, is still working very hard on, on things like this, working with grassroots health as well. And this shows about almost a factor of 10 variation in diabetes mellitus type 2 incidence, going from about 5 nanograms per milliliter to towards 100 nanograms per milliliter. Um, of course, there are other factors. Diet plays a role, uh, uh, but this indicates that, that, that vitamin D and UVB expo exposure also seem to play an important role. Cardiovascular disease, uh, here is a meta-analysis uh, of many prospective studies. And what you see here is that there's a plateau above about 20 nanograms per milliliter. So since most people who take part in clinical trials are, are often people who, who are health conscious and maybe go to the doctor and get enrolled, maybe it's no, no surprise that the clinical trials haven't shown a benefit uh, uh, for cardiovascular disease yet because most of the effect appears to be below 15 or 20 nanograms per milliliter. In fact, it, it's much more common in winter than in summer. In winter, you have more people have the lower concentrations. Now, for infectious diseases, um, uh, respiratory diseases are more frequent in winter. This is due to a number of factors, including lower UVB doses, lower 25-hydroxy vitamin D concentrations, but also temperature and humidity play a role. Um, influenza virus can live much longer outside a human body when it's both low temperature and low relative humidity. Polio was the opposite. Polio lived much long, longer when it's hot and humid. So that's why it was associated with swimming in swimming pools and pe meeting people there. So, um, so, you know, from one point of view, you have influenza epidemics in winter because of, of several factors, but it has been shown through clinical trials that giving people vitamin D Either uh, this has been done for African-American postmenopausal women in New Long Island, school children in Japan, 
taking vitamin D does reduce risk of type A influenza. And what vitamin D does is it reduces production of cathocidin, which has antibiotic properties, a natural antibiotic, and it also into, it reduces inflammation. So the reason that people die from uh, influenza is not from the influenza per se, but because of the ensuing pneumonia. And I did a study back, uh, published in 2009, showing that if you looked at the case fatality rate from the uh, pandemic influenza in 1918, 1919, the, the communities that had higher UVB doses had the lower case fatality rate. And we figured out it was partly because of uh, fighting uh, the, the bacterial infection, but also reducing inflammation. Uh, so if you get influenza, you want to start taking uh, vitamin D. Okay, so just to show you that, that solar radiation and vitamin D both help to fight infection, both through uh, affecting the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. Vaccines are only uh, working on the adaptive immune system, but the innate immune system is very, very important too. Uh, going on to other diseases, here's uh, uh, Moore and Garland plotted a, a showing that, that um, type 1 diabetes has this, what they call a smiley curve, very low rate in the tropics, very high rates at high latitudes. In fact, a study in Finland uh, found out that when the infants in the first year of life were given 2,000 IU per day, uh, the type 1 diabetes rate was very low. Then for some reason, they started giving them less, only 1,000 IU per day, then 400 IU per day. And of course, the type 1 diabetes rates went up. Um, here's autism prevalence. Um, John Connell, uh, who runs the vitamin D Council, uh, proposed in 2008 that vitamin D deficiency was a risk factor for autism. Um, Rhonda Patrick and Bruce Ames in 2014 showed that maternal vitamin D deficiency uh, reduced the production of serotonin, and that is then a risk factor for autism. What we showed in this uh, study was if we plotted the prevalence of autism for children aged 10 to 17 years of age, that there was a um, somewhat of a, a, a geographical variation. We also showed that, that the African American um, rate was higher uh, than the, the Caucasian rate. Uh, there was mention of, of um, food allergies. Um, uh, studies both in the United States and in Chile uh, based on either, in the United States it's based on EpiPen prescriptions, in Chile it's based on um, uh, admission to the hospital, shows that at the higher latitudes there's more uh, food allergy, but also in, in, uh, um, in Chile uh, children are also affected more by drugs. Um, and uh, they're all, all, okay. Now, I mentioned earlier that, that uh, uh, cardiovascular disease rates are higher in winter, uh, uh, influenza rates are higher in winter. So uh, uh, Professor Phillips from San Diego area uh, published a paper in 2010 that uh, plotted the death rate. Uh, he got all the daily death data from 1979 to 2004 and plotted it. And I happened to see it in the, the Wall Street Journal about three or four years ago and got the data, the raw, the, the raw data, and plotted it, and um, proposed that, um, that it was low vitamin D uh, uh, and, and low UVB that helped explain the, the, um, the high rates in the winter. He was looking at what he called the holiday effect. There's an extra peak of a few percent around Christmas and New Year, which the best we can, th it also appears in the Southern Hemisphere uh, when they have their Christmas at the end of the year, but it's very sunny. And the idea was that, well, maybe the hospitals are understaffed, people come in and are just not treated well. Um, there's also little bumps around February and March, and at the end of summer, I think these are related to people mixing through holidays, or, or coming back from summer holiday, going back to school, and bringing viruses they acquired, bringing them home, giving them to older people who then die. I, it's just sort of a hypothesis, but it, it seems to make sense. Now, getting back to, to sunlight, there was a, a study in, in Sweden, uh, which was 
looking at sun exposure and risk of melanoma. But Pele Lindquist, the, the, the leader of that group, figured, well, why not look at mortality rate as a function of sun exposure? And what he found was that over a 15-year period, there was a factor of two difference between high and low sun exposure. Those who, um, who had high expo sun exposure had only about a 4% uh, 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 death rate over the 15 years, whereas those who had low sun exposure had about, a, about an 8% exposure. And what he said was that we interpreted this as suggesting that sun exposure avoidance is a risk factor for all cause death of the same magnitude as smoking. Uh, now, what they found there is similar to what's been seen in prospective studies, again, Garland. Uh, this is a result of 32 prospective studies showing that those that had less than 10 nanograms per milliliter had about twice the uh, mor mortality rate of people who had above 40 nanograms per milliliter. I did a, another study which I uh, looked at population, uh, looked at various countries, and said, okay, these countries have a lot of disease and mortality rates from a lot of diseases linked to low vitamin D, cardiovascular disease, cancer, respiratory infections, respiratory diseases, tuberculosis, diabetes, and other vitamin D sensitive diseases. And if I took what was known in 2011 about the relationship between 25 hydroxy vitamin D and health outcome or, or, or mortality rates, um, I could uh, estimate that if, if the serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentration increased from 22 to 44 nanograms per milliliter, that would reduce the vitamin D sensitive disease mortality rate by about 15, 20%. And in Northern Europe, that would reduce the um, mortality rate by about 15 to 17%. Uh, that would in, then increase the life expectancy by two years. We'll have questions at the end. Um, now, for African Americans, they have a, like I mentioned earlier, they have a mean concentration of 25 hydroxy vitamin D near 16 nanograms per milliliter, where white uh, Europeans have more like 26 nanograms per milliliter. That's because they have dark skin and they're just much less efficient at making uh, vitamin D. Because if we go to East Africans who wear their traditional robe and are out every day uh, with attending their flocks or dealing with their crops, they have values near 40 to 45 nanograms per milliliter. So, like I said earlier, their, their skin is ideally suited for Africa. Uh, the paler skin is more ideally suited for higher latitudes. Now, it turns out African Americans have poor health outcomes from whites for many diseases, pregnancy, uh, premature birth, uh, 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 life expectancy, et cetera. And I think that a lower vitamin D status can explain a significant portion of the disparities. In fact, Bruce Ames, a distinguished uh, scientist living in Oakland, who stopped driving about a year ago and started taking Uber, would tell his, his drivers about vitamin D, tell them to take vitamin D and let him, let him know what happened. He got enough positive feedback about they slept better, the pain went away, they felt better, et cetera, that he decided to write a, a paper about the benefits of vitamin D for, for dark-skinned people, calling it latitude mismatch. And I'm working with him on that. And, um, we're making progress. Uh, one thing that may interest, do, interest some people is that male sexual function is somewhat linked to, to vitamin D status. Uh, higher tw serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D can increase testosterone concentrations. Erectile dysfunction related to vascular factors is linked to low vitamin D status, and vitamin D improves vascular condition. Uh, having ED is, uh, due to vascular effects is a marker of increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, turning to pregnancy and birth outcomes. So women in all ethnic groups have lighter skin pigmentations, as shown in this photograph, likely due to vitamin D requirements during pregnancy and lactation. So uh, another study, this is a study from South Carolina, organized by Grassroots Health. Uh, 1,000 women were enrolled, given free vitamin D supplements, told to try to reach above 40 nanograms per milliliter. And those who did had a reduced risk of preterm birth by 60% compared to all those who didn't. And this included Hispanics, African Americans, and white Americans. This was also recently published, published last year in PLOS 1. Other benefits of vitamin D during pregnancy for the mother include reduced risk of C-section, 
um, uh, reduced risk of di gestational diabetes, reduced risk of preeclampsia. For the infant, there's reduced risk of uh, asthma, autism, and rickets, to name a few. So there are many other diseases that have been linked to low sun exposure or, and or vitamin D. Alzheimer's disease, um, asthma, Crohn's disease, or irritable bowel is one type of irritable bowel disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, depression, falls and fractures, multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson's disease. In fact, multiple sclerosis increases rapidly with latitude, uh, and there's some thought it may be due to UV non-vitamin D effects, although it could also be just it's a long latency disease, and so that when they notice that people who had more UV exposure when they were young don't get multiple sclerosis when they're older, it could be that it affected their immune system way back when. So there are many non-vitamin D effects of sunlight, and I'm going to go over some of them in greater detail than others. So there's activation of the skin's neuroendocrine system, release of beta endorphins, effect on uh, a circadian rhythm via blue light, lowering blood pressure, um, there are infrared radiation benefits, and just the enjoyment of out of doors. So here's a very busy slide. Um, I just, it just shows that there are many, many systems that interface between the sun and the body that take place in the skin. It's, the skin is our, most, our largest organ and perhaps our most, one of our most important organs. It feels be good to be in the sun. Uh, beta endorphin, an endogenous opioid peptide, is produced in the skin via UVB exposure. It has been demonstrated to improve not only feeling of well-being, but also can cause pain relief and relaxation. Dermatologists have linked it to addiction to tanning bed use. Uh, my response is, hey, anything that has long-term health benefits, uh, maybe the body gets a short-term reward, like food, drink, sex, and, and sun. So just live with it. Uh, uh, circadian rhythm. Uh, blue light entering the eye's retinal ganglion cell photoreceptor connected to the pineal gland affects circadian rhythm by suppressing melatonin con concentrations. Too much blue light in the evening, like watching TV or the screen, can uh, disrupt sleep. Uh, morning or evening blue light can help regulate the wake sleep cycle. Uh, UVA exposure lowers blood pressure. UVA exposure liberates nitric oxide from nitrogen stores below the skin, and nitric oxide lowers blood pressure. Blood pressure is lower in the tropics than at high latitudes. Uh, the near-infrared radiation has benefits too. The beneficial effects of low doses of IR on the skin include uh, photoprotection against UV-induced damage, photorejuvenation, reduction of pigmented lesions, and fewer fine lines and wrinkles. People enjoy being in the sun. Uh, it's well known. Uh, but dermatologists warn people to avoid or cover up in the sun. They seldom discuss the fact that sunscreen blocks UVB and reduces vitamin D production. If they do, they say very little uh, exposure required to make just a little bit of vitamin D. They tend to view any discussion of vitamin D's benefits would encourage people to spend more time in the sun, raising the risk of skin cancer and melanoma. Now, if you look at the cancer statistics in the United States, uh, melanoma cases represent 5.3% of all cancer cases, but only 1.5% of all cancer deaths. In terms of all deaths, you have 0.35% uh, risk of dying from melanoma, or in other words, one in 300 chance. And um, yet about, um, you know, 20, uh, well, at least 20% of the deaths are linked to low vitamin D. So uh, you've got quite a ratio of benefit to, to, to risk for melanoma. But it turns out that, that, con that, that chronic sun exposure is not really uh, much of a risk factor for melanoma because the skin has many ways of protecting against melanoma. First of all, uh, of course, dark skin, um, like Africans, don't develop melanoma except maybe on their palms and the soles of their feet or where they have a wound that don't, they don't get good pigmentation. So the uh, dark skin and then tanning, you can induce tanning, get a factor of four protection uh, if you go out every day in the spring and sort of build up a, a tan gradually. Um, the, um, and so that's pr 
provides a protective umbrella in the skin over the lower epidermis. You develop a thicker outer layer of skin called a stratum corneum. You produce vitamin D, and vitamin D fights melanoma just like it fights internal cancers. They found that people diagnosed with melanoma who have higher 25-hydroxy vitamin D have thinner melanomas. They find that people diagnosed with melanoma and with higher 25-hydroxy vitamin D have a better survival rate. Uh, you have also antioxidant defenses against free radicals from the, from the melanin. And note that most melanoma occur, uh, occurs in skin that rarely see the sun, such as one, one minute. Uh, exposed in beach and holiday, okay. Uh, just show here that um, melanoma rates have gone out when sun exposure has gone down. Uh, Celtic skin, or red hair and freckles, doesn't protect well against um, sun exposure. So that's why in Australia, which has mainly um, people with that kind of skin, are told to uh, stay in the skin, uh, out. Um, if you get your serum 25 hydroxy up to around 40 to 50 nanograms per milliliter, you can stay in the sun twice as long as if you have low 25 hydroxy vitamin D without getting burned. I'll skip this. So what to do? Try to get your sun exposure in your solar noon for maximum UVB. Um, you can make 10,000 IU per day in an hour uh, if there's a lot of sun and your whole body's exposed. So that's why taking 5,000 or 10,000 IU per day is, not, is something that the body is used to. Uh, consider using a UV or sun simulator lamp, take sunny vacations in winter or summer, and take vitamin D3 supplements, 2,000 to 5,000 IU per day. Try to raise your serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D above, to above 40 nanograms per milliliter. Anyway, the book Embrace the Sun. Uh, Mark Sorensen is the principal author. Uh, I'm the, more the scientific advisor author. And then Adiel Tel Oran, who'll be speaking here in September, uh, wrote an appendix and uh, did a lot of editing. Mark Sorensen is a longtime vegan and a sun worshiper who lives in St. George, Utah. Uh, this book grew out of the uh, effort by both of us independently, helping to fight a Federal Trade Commission lawsuit regarding somebody who was selling UVB lamps, saying they produced vitamin D and wasn't that a good thing. Uh, the book has 346 pages, including 1,224 footnotes. Thank you. All right, unfortunately we have to be out of here by 10 o'clock, so not enough time for questions, unfortunately, but thank you all for coming. As he mentioned, in September, Dr. T will be here and next month we have a lecture on stem cells, which should be really good. So please come back and join us. Thank you all for coming.